So without further ado, um, I'm going to turn it over to our League of Women Voters representative, Bernie. Thank you, Kate. Uh, before we begin, I'll give you our little blurb that shows the uh, status of the League of Women Voters in discussions. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan grassroots organization working to protect and expand voting rights and ensure everyone, in, in, everyone is represented in democracy. We empower voters and defend democracy through advocacy, education, and litigation at the local, state, and national levels. Okay. And today our topic is ranked choice voting. And our speaker is Jonathan Perlow, who is connected with the Connecticut Against Gun Violence, which I think many of you, if you haven't been involved or at least gotten emails from that group, you're probably <laughs> one of the few in the state that haven't. Uh, it is a very active organization and is very powerful in getting the word out on terms of gun violence and, and the, the danger to the society. Uh, in the area of election reform, Jonathan has played a key role in getting the grassroots campaign that Connecticut got to join in the national popular vote campaign and helped get us to be one of the first states to uh, okay that, and to become part of it. Uh, he also helped to uh, passage of uh, Bill HB 5054, which prohibits uh, people who are uh, victims of domestic violence, they have a temporary ability to restrain orders from possessing arms from anybody who has been uh, violating them in the past. Uh, most of Jonathan's previous experience has been in advertising, public relations, online communication campaigns. He has worked for many years with a division, I believe it's Young and Muakon. Uh, it's called Wonder Man, which he worked for close to 20 years. Uh, many of his clients include the United, United Airlines, Citigroup, uh, Dell, HP, IBM, and many others. Uh, he has become very active over the last several years, probably from 2016 on when he became the director of programs and communications with the Connecticut Against Gun Violence group uh, in speaking out about the problems of guns and violence within our society, and particularly within Connecticut. Uh, he has his BA in economics from Amherst and he's got an MBA from the University of Chicago. And with that, I will let turn the program over to Jonathan to explain to us what ranked choice voting is all about and why we don't have it yet. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Bernie and Kate, and to the Litchfield Historical Society and the League of Women Voters of Litchfield. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for that very extensive bio. I <laughs> haven't heard it in a while. Uh, so. Just to be clear, my day job is as communications director for Connecticut Against Gun Violence, but this is my sort of extracurricular activity um, in terms of uh, working for election reform and expanding um, the freedom to vote. Um, so we are here to talk to you about ranked choice voting, and I'm going to share my screen. Um, and definitely, as Kate mentioned, um, if you have questions along the way and you want to kind of pop them into the chat so you don't forget them, you know, feel free to do so. Um, and there'll definitely be time at the end to, to answer questions. Um, so again, thank you everybody for showing up and spending a Sunday afternoon. Um, and thank you also, I know we had this scheduled for um, earlier in the month and um, there was a death of my family. And so I appreciate the fact um, that everybody was flexible in terms of allowing us to reschedule. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. So um, we'd like to talk about ranked choice voting as a must have election reform. Um, and that's certainly what we believe, but really the purpose of coming to talk to you today is either hopefully getting to, to the point where you, you also believe that it's a must have election reform, or at least to the point where you're intrigued enough to say, this is something that is worth looking more into. And that's kind of what our current legislative advocacy goal right now is to try to get the state to look into um, what it would take uh, to implement ranked choice voting in Connecticut. Um, so, but I do hope to convince you um, of its import and how it could really help our democracy. Um, 
this was from a recent um, um, op-ed in the New York Times where they were talking about what Alaska has um, done with its elections. They had a ballot um, initiative last, uh, in, in uh, 2020 um, that both um, included top four open primaries and ranked choice voting for their state elections and state and federal elections. Um, and as this um, op-ed um, concluded that ranked choice voting, which is one of the two things are among the most promising structural solutions that could really help mitigate um, the extremism that we're seeing in politics today. Um, and later on in the presentation, I'll talk about um, what just happened this past week that kind of, kind of shows how ranked choice voting potentially can change the sort of the, the way um, elected officials kind of make calculations about things they should support. So when we think of what makes for a strong democracy, we like to talk about four pillars. The first is to make voting easy. So, um, you know, just literally, if there's an election, it shouldn't be difficult to cast your vote. Um, second is expanding the electorate and to, you know, to every citizen that is eligible um, and so that as many people can participate in democracy as possible. The third is election integrity. And, you know, we, we hear a lot about, um, you know, voter fraud and things like that. A lot of that really misrepresenting what the reality of elections are in the United States. But there are a lot of other areas where we really do have to be worried about election integrity, and that gets into um, cybersecurity um, and you know, making sure every vote is counted, things like that. Um, but these, these three pillars all deal with sort of how who can vote um, and how the process works. But equally important, we believe, is what's the outcome of those elections? So we, we can talk about having free and fair elections. But that alone doesn't guarantee that um, the outcomes are, are strengthening our representative democracy. Um, and Bernie referred to one of the, the goals of the League of Women, Women Voters is to be sure that everyone is represented in our democracy. Um, and that's really what ranked choice voting is about. Um, Connecticut last year and continuing into this year has made some important strides against all four of these pillars. So if you think back to the 2021 um, legislative session, the um, ballot um, re referendum to, um, or ballot question to see whether we should amend our state constitution to allow for early voting was passed a second time. So it's gonna show up on the ballot this fall. Um, the first step in doing the same thing for no excuse absentee voting um, happened last year. Um, automatic voter registration was expanded from just the DMV to other state agencies to make it easier for people to um, register to vote. In terms of expanding the electorate, um, parolees were re-enfranchised. So now if you are a person on parole, um, you are allowed to vote. Um, election integrity, although this, this is in a sense a small thing, with um, more and more people voting by mail, particularly because the, uh, in the last year because of the pandemic and that was approved again um, going forward this year. And given the problems with the uh, postal service, there were definitely concerns of people you know, returning their ballot and will, will the ballot get back to town hall to actually get counted. And so in terms of, if we think about election integrity is making sure your vote counts or is, is, is going to be counted, um, having these permanent ballot drop boxes certainly helps that. Um, and then in terms of representative outcomes, um, something that Connecticut did last year, joining not a lot of other states, but um, about a dozen or so other states, was to end what is called prison gerrymandering. And that's the practice of um, counting incarcerated per, um, people for the purposes of districting where they're incarcerated as opposed to where they came from or where they live. Um, and the feeling is, um, since they don't get to vote, um, and you know, they, they don't command a whole lot of attention of the elected officials in the areas where they are imprisoned. Um, and so it really makes sense to count them for purposes of representation where they came up, where they, where they came from, where they were currently living before being incarcerated. And then this year, um, I haven't added it to the list, um, a number of other things have happened. So um, 
absentee voting was we we still don't have no excuse absentee voting, but just this week, um, Governor Lamont signed into law an expansion of the reasons for absentee ballot uh, absentee voting, which was good. Um, there's another uh, another other measures being considered. Um, but to understand the whole issue around representative election outcomes, um, we have to start with how do elections work today. So today's elections use plurality voting, sometimes called first past the post. And we're all familiar with that, obviously. You mark your ballot for one candidate, and then the candidate with the most votes wins, even if they don't get a majority of the ballots cast. The um, problem with plurality voting is it kind of has some systemic weaknesses essentially built into its design. Um, and if you think about the, the sort of fundamental purpose of democratic elections is to represent the will of the majority. Um, when we have more than two candidates running an election, and I wanna be clear, um, these problems that I'm about to talk about and ranked choice voting only apply when you have more than two candidates running. If there's just two candidates running, a ranked choice voting election produces exactly the same outcome as a plurality election. Um, but when you do have two candidates running, um, plurality voting can fail to hit this um, objective of representing the will of the majority because the person who is elected may not have actually gotten a majority of the votes cast. Um, and when that happens, um, democracy can suffer because people are not being represented as well as perhaps a different election system might have produced, ranked choice voting in this case. Um, and, and ultimately, and sort of on um, in a larger sense, voter trust suffers because they don't see the people being elected as really representing them or representing the electorate. Oops. Um, so, sorry. Uh, so there's four particular consequences of plurality voting, unintended consequences of plurality voting. Um, one is spoiler candidates. The second is vote splitting. The third is wasted votes, and the fourth is negative campaigning. And I'm going to go through each one of those and sort of explain what, why, why these things happen, and what they are. So the spoiler effect is when you have a third party candidate with really very little chance of winning, siphoning off more votes from one opponent than the other. Um, and as a re result, the presence of that third party candidate essentially changes the outcome of the election from what it would have been had that candidate not run, even though that candidate really has no chance of winning. And um, this has happened um, over the course of our presidential elections and certainly in lots of other elections. Um, and it's not um, an effect that favors or, or hurts one party versus another. So if you look back to 1992, um, Ross Perot ran as an independent and he gained, compared to other people that had run um, as independents or unaffiliated in previous years, he got quite a, quite a few votes, nearly 20 million votes. And um, in general, um, the feeling was that he was taking votes, more votes away from George Bush as being more of a conservative than more of a um, liberal and, and therefore not taking as many votes away from Bill Clinton. And so in a number of states, he quite arguably did shift the outcome um, of who won that state's electoral votes. And it was enough um, to potentially make the difference that Clinton won the election um, if, if Perot had not been there. And so in this case, Republicans blamed Perot as the third party candidate for George Bush's defeat. And I think with, um, with a reasonable um, evidence. And then, of course, in 2000, we had the flip, um, the flip side of the Democrats blaming a third party candidate, Ralph Nader, for Al Gore's defeat in Florida. Um, and in that case, you know, it was just one state lost by 537 votes. And if you notice that Ralph Nader got nearly 100,000 votes and um, exit polls clearly showed that um, had Nader not been um, in that election, certainly a, a large majority of his votes would have gone to Al Gore and therefore Al Gore would have won the Florida um, election um, had Ralph Nader not been there. So spoiler candidates can affect both parties. Um, and so the presence of a candidate with no chance of winning um, shouldn't really change the outcome of the election. 
um, which is not to say that, um, well, I kind of get into the fact that um, our current system, plurality system, discourages third party candidates from running is not a good thing. People should have choice. Vote splitting um, is another sort of unintended consequence of plurality voting. And this happens when you have generally a crowded field and that tends to be more with primaries than general elections, but you have um, like-minded candidates who end up splitting the vote. Um, and as a result, a small faction of the electorate and whether they're primary voters or general election voters, um, delivering the victory to um, a candidate who is otherwise unpopular among the, the rest of the electorate. And so as an example of this and not to to pick on Donald Trump, um, but he won the early Republican primaries um, in, in generally when twice as many people preferred other candidates um, than him. But the problem was those 65% or so of the voters were splitting their um, votes up among 10 other candidates. And so obviously none of them were able to kind of get to a threshold beyond the 33 or you know third of the votes or so that Donald Trump was getting. So. Um, by the end of the Republican primary um, in 2016, Trump was the winner based on plurality voting, um, even though overall in all the different states, a majority of voters um, had preferred other candidates. Um, the third problem is wasted votes, um, which is very simply that votes cast early um, don't really have any, don't matter, and the voters don't get to have a say in the outcome if the candidate they vote for later drops out on or before election day. And an example of this was in 2020, a couple days before Super Tuesday in the Democratic primary, um, three candidates, Pete Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar, and Tom Steyer, dropped out of the Democratic primary. Um, the problem was um, in those, those Super Tuesday states, um, more than a million voters had already cast early ballots and for those three candidates, and they didn't have any say in the outcome. Um, and it's quite clear the reason those three can't, well, I shouldn't say quite clear, but it's, it's presumably clear um, why the three candidates dropped out. They were, all three of them were moderates, and they were worried about vote splitting. They worried that if they remained in the race, um, they their um, people who were voting for them was the, the moderate Democrats voting in the primary would split their votes among those three and Joe Biden, thus presumably electing or, or uh, leading to the election in those states of Bernie Sanders, who was the candidate they least preferred. Um, and so they, they wanted to avoid the problem of vote splitting. Um, and then the fourth problem is win at all cost campaigning. So it's um, unfortunately sort of human behavior that we pay more attention to negative information. It kind of, um, it has the potential for scaring us and um, we remember it. Um, and you kind of want to vote against bad things from happening versus in some cases, good things. Um, and with plurality voting, there's really no downside to tearing down your opponent because from the candidate's perspective, either you're going to get the vote or you're not. Um, and obviously you wanna get the vote. And so there's not much downside to tearing down your opponents. So these problems that I've described um, have happened here in Connecticut um, as recently as 2018 um, in the gubernatorial campaign. First, if you looked at the Republican primary, um, Bob Stefanowski won that primary with only, with less than a third of the vote, which means you know more than twice as many Republican primary voters preferred other candidates. Um, and then in the general election, um, there was third party candidate Oz Griebel, um, and he received 55,000 votes um, in a race that Bob Stefanowski lost by only 44,000 votes. And there are those who feel that, that Griebel was sort of more conservative leaning and therefore he took more votes away from Stefanowski than he did from Lamont. Now it's, you know, it's impossible to say whether that was the case or not, um, but I do know from having participated in, in that campaign, um, people in both, in both the Democratic and Republican party were really worried that Oz Griebel was gonna act as a spoiler. Um, and one might argue that Bob Stefanowski was essentially a, a weak primary or a, a, a Republican nominee 
because of the fact that he had so little support within his own party. Um, and perhaps if they had used, as I will describe, ranked choice voting, they might have ended up with a um, primary nominee who was you know, more moderate and therefore might have, might have actually done better in the general election. So what this really boils down to, what's kind of going on underneath all this, is that our preferences aren't all or nothing. So um, if we are presented with choices, it's just human nature that we have degrees of preference. And um, if, we, if our first choice isn't available, we have a backup. And as an example, if I go into Baskin Robbins and I say I'd like a chocolate ice cream cone and they say, I'm sorry, Jonathan, uh, we don't have chocolate today. I don't um, turn around and say, well, just give me any one of those other 30 flavors. I really don't care. Of course not. I'll say, well, if you don't have chocolate, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take a coffee ice cream um, instead. And so kind of a rhetorical question here is, shouldn't that be reflected in our voting system? If your first if your first choice can't win or isn't available in a sense, shouldn't you be able to have a backup choice? And the answer is yes. Um, with ranked choice voting, instead of picking just one candidate, um, ranked choice voting lets you rank multiple candidates in the order you prefer them. Um, I'm gonna show a short video um, that kind of explains how it works and, um, and then we'll come back. <laughs> So what is ranked choice voting? In most parts of the United States, voters select a single candidate for each position on their ballot, and the candidate with the most votes wins. This is known as single choice winner take all, which can sometimes result in the election of a candidate who earned only a small percentage of the vote, even when the majority of voters supported other candidates. But that's not the only way of electing our leaders. Ranked choice voting is another voting method which allows voters to rank their candidates in order of preference. In a ranked choice voting election, a candidate needs to earn more than half of the votes to win. All first choices are counted, and if a candidate has a majority, then they win, just like any other election. If not, the candidate with the fewest votes is eliminated, and voters who picked that candidate as number one will have their votes count for their next choice. This process continues until a candidate earns a majority and is declared the winner. Let's look at an example. Here, you select orange as your first choice candidate, yellow as your second, pink as your third, and green as your final choice. The first choices are counted. Yellow earned 35%, orange 21%, pink earned 28%, and green earned 16% of the vote. Because nobody won more than 50%, the candidate with the fewest votes is eliminated, and voters who picked him as their first choice have their ballots count for their second choice. This continues until a candidate receives more than half of the votes, or 50% plus one. Okay, so um, kind of going over the key elements of ranked choice voting, voters have the option to rank candidates according to their preference. You don't have to, so if you just want to vote for a first choice and, and not indicate a second or third choice, that's okay. Um, but if you would like to um, indicate what your preferences are, you can do that. Um, and then the votes are tallied and the, the, the first choice votes are tallied. And if one candidate gets a majority of first choice votes, that candidate is the winner, just like in a plurality election. But if no candidate gets a majority or 50% plus one of the votes cast on the first round or of the first choice votes, the candidate with the fewest votes is eliminated and the voters who picked that candidate as their first choice have their second choice vote count, votes count. Excuse me. And that process continues until one candidate um, gets 50% plus one of the votes cast. So, Whoops. Uh, what are the benefits of ranked choice voting? Well, first, it frees voters to express their true preferences without fear of electing their least favorite candidate. And this really gets to um, the issue of spoiler candidates, where you go into the booth and let's say um, Oz Griebel really is your favorite candidate, but you're worried if you vote for him, you might end up electing, and I don't know who, who your least fa favorite candidate might be, but let's say the least favorite candidate, whoever that was. And so you end up sort of gaming the system, um, or not gaming the system, but kind of trying to strategize and say, well, even though I really like Oz Griebel, I'm going to vote for 
Bob Stefanowski because I'm worried um, if I don't vote for Bob, who's my second choice, I'm gonna end up with Ned being elected and he was my third choice, hypothetically. Um, and a similar type of sort of strategizing goes on in terms of vote splitting, where you go into the booth and you say, well, there's, um, let's say it's the primary and there's, there's three moderate candidates and I wanna make sure a moderate gets elected. Gee, I wonder who other people are supporting. And you try to figure out who you know, other people are supporting, which if we could figure that out, you know, the, the pundits would be out of jobs. Um, so the second, um, the, the second benefit is that it promotes more diverse candidates and viewpoints. Um, there are plenty of situations, and as I described with the, the Super Tuesday example for the Democratic primary, where candidates just won't, won't run because they don't want to sort of being, be, they don't want to risk being put in the position of acting as a spoiler or splitting the vote. And so if those concerns um, no longer exist because we're using ranked choice voting, then more people are going to run and that obviously gives um, voters more choices um, to consider. Um, thirdly, it reduces negative campaigning. If um, as a candidate, um, I might need somebody's second choice vote to win, I'm going to um, behave differently than I might have if, it, if only first choices mattered. And so as an example, let's say I'm canvassing um, and I see my opponent's um, lawn sign up in front of somebody, somebody's house, under plurality voting, I'm probably just gonna walk right by. It's like, you know, why bother going to that person? It's clear they don't want me. Um, but under ranked choice voting, and again, this would be where there's more than two candidates running, I might go to that house and say, hey, you know, I see um, you are your, your first choice apparently is my opponent. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that there's some things that we share in common. And so I would encourage you to think of me as your second choice. And so all of a sudden we've gone from me as a candidate trashing my opponent to actually looking for um, points of agreement. Um, and really kind of most fundamentally, it ensures the winner has majority support and recognizing that, recognizing that preferences aren't all or nothing, it doesn't mean that the person who was elected was the first choice of everybody, but it does really mean it's the consensus candidate. It's the one who the most people preferred to some degree or another. And um, if the more that that happens, people will look at election outcomes and say, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not so happy that my candidate didn't win, but, you know, I can accept the outcome, at least at least the one that I like second best won. And that's going to increase people's confidence in, in the fact that our democracy is actually working, working in terms of representing them. Um, ranked choice voting um, is being recognized um, by a lot of different um, type individuals, um, influencers, um, but this one was particularly interesting. The American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which has been around for uh, it's like over 200 years and is sort of, um, among other things, um, advocates for civic engagement. Um, in 2020, uh, they did a very um, extensive report on um, things that they believe are necessary for essentially strengthening our economy, or not our economy, our democracy, um, as we look forward towards the 21st century. Um, and one of those things was um, ranked choice voting, and they, there were six different key strategies. And one of them was um, to achieve equality of voice and representation, and ranked choice voting was, was recommended as doing that. Um, it's getting a lot of attention. Papers around um, the country um, have run editorials in support of ranked choice voting. Um, last year, ranked choice voting bills were introduced in 29 different states, including here in Connecticut. Um, so this is something that is really, there's, there's broad appeal around the country and frankly in both um, red and blue states. Um, for the first time ever last year, Congress voted um, on a bill concerning ranked choice voting. Um, so as um, part of the Protecting Our Democracy Act um, that was passed in the House, there was an amendment that voted to um, appropriate $40 million to support cities and states um, as they implement ranked choice voting. And so this was notable. Um, in that Congress was now actually taking a stand saying this is an election reform that they believe in. Um, and here in Connecticut, all five of our 
um, uh, U.S. Representative, representatives voted for this bill. Uh, and not only is um, our people around the country working to get ranked choice voting adopted, um, but it's also it's already being used. Um, so as I mentioned, um, in Maine and Alaska, um, it is used for statewide and presidential elections, not, not all statewide elections in Maine, but but in Alaska. Um, it was used in um, actually five um, presidential primaries and caucuses um, in 2020. Um, it was used in the Republican um, primary for the Virginia gubernatorial race um, last year. Um, and it's been used um, at the local level. Interesting, um, in a number of Southern states, it's used for military and overseas voters. And the reason for that is those ballots, the overseas ballots have to be printed far in advance and they have to worry about the problem of a candidate who is running you know, two months from election day may not be still in the race come election day. And so they wanna make sure those um, voters who have to vote far in advance um, actually have the opportunity for a second choice. Um, so one of the questions, the, probably the most frequent question we get um, is, you know, is this too complicated? Are voters gonna understand how to use it? Um, and the answer from where it is being used um, is yes, voters understand how to use it. They in fact do use it, which is to say, they take advantage of the opportunity to rank more than one candidate, and they actually prefer using it. Um, in New York City, you may recall, used ranked choice voting for the first time in its mayoral and, and city council primary last spring. And the exit polls there showed that um, three quarters of voters wanted to use it again. Four out of five voters actually ranked more than one candidate, and virtually everyone found the ballot simple to complete. Um, and I will say, explaining how ranked choice voting works is a little bit more difficult than actually just putting a ballot in front of somebody and saying pick and, and saying pick your first choice, second choice, and third choice, which is the instructions are not all that complicated. Um, that said, voter education is important to success. Um, in um, New York City, they had really quite a substantial voter education process. And they actually also had candidate education um, forums to really help candidates understand how to um, campaign and kind of the way it was going to work. Um, and these results from New York City have been seen um, in municipalities that have been using ranked choice voting in some cases for quite a few years around the country. Whoops. Um, another question we get is, well, you know, which party does ranked choice voting favor? Um, and the answer is it doesn't favor parties, it favors voters. Um, it's inherently a nonpartisan election reform. And if you look at the organizations like the American Academy of Arts and Sciences that have endorsed it, they are nonpartisan um, organizations. Um, and that's not to say that in one election or another, if ranked choice voting was used, it wouldn't have favored one party versus another. So if you think back to the 92 election, that might have favored the Republican candidate. And if you look to the 2000 presidential election, that would have favored the Democratic candidate. But there's no um, systematic bias in terms of um, how ranked choice voting would affect the outcomes. And to the degree that it, that it favors any party, it favors parties that have candidates that have broad appeal among the electorate. But that's not because it favors Democrats or Republicans. It's because it favors candidates who represent the electorate. Um, and, and so in the end, we really say, voters are the winners under ranked choice voting. Um, they get more choices and the outcomes better reflect what the electorate as a whole wants or the consensus of the electorate. Um, a third question that we have frequently been asked is, um, is ranked choice voting good for underrepresented, underrepresented communities, in particular women and candidates of color? Um, and from where it is being used, um, we have seen both increases in the numbers of women and candidate people of color running for office and the success rates or the, the percentage of, of those um, constituencies that are actually getting elected. Um, in terms of how it affects the electorate itself, um, there is um, good evidence, again, from where it is being used, mostly in the municipal, municipal level, that it increases voter turnout, um, and it doesn't create more disparity in turnout between, let's say, white voters and voters of color than already exists today. Um, and there have been studies that show that voters of color understand ranked choice voting ballots 
just as well as white voters do, um, and they use those ranking options. Um, and an interesting sort of observation in terms of the New York City um, primary and the, the city council races, um, for the first time in history, a majority of women candidates were elected to the New York City Council, and a majority of those women were actually candidates of color. Um, so again, the evidence um, where it is being used suggests that um, it is actually good for underrepresented communities. Um, and then lastly, using an example from um, just a few days ago, um, ranked choice voting encourages moderation. And um, I talked about at the beginning how some people looking at um, Alaska and also Maine who uses ranked choice voting for federal elections and talked about how it's really the election reform that can um, resolve some of our this underlying very serious partisanship that's going on in our political um, environment these days. And um, this op-ed that was published just uh, yesterday or the day before um, made the observation that one of the reasons that Murkowski in particular, but also Collins may have felt more secure in going against the rest of their party in voting for the nomination of, um, of Judge Jackson to the Supreme Court is because they are in states with ranked choice voting. And Murkowski in particular, with Alaska, what they have um, are top four, what they are, have starting this year because it was voted on um, in a referendum in 2020, is um, what's called open top four open primaries. So the primary is um, open to all voters and is not a Democratic primary or Republican primary, so anybody can run. And then the top four candidates and um, the, the candidates who get the top four who get the most votes then automatically go on to the general election, regardless of which party they represent. So you could have two Republicans and an independent and a Democrat or, or whatever mix might, might happen. And then in the general election, they're gonna use ranked choice voting. And so um, this, um, the open primary gets rid of the problem where you kind of have, you know, base voters voting in the primary and then producing a candidate who is, who is less um, appealing to the overall electorate. So Murkowski, um, in, in fact, um, being you know, a, a relatively moderate Republican actually um, stands to be protected by ranked choice voting in her state. Um, so um, we believe it is time to bring ranked choice voting to Connecticut. Um, Voter Choice Connecticut, we are a citizen-led all-volunteer group. We came together at the end of 2018. Um, Bernie mentioned that I, and there was a bunch of others, um, had been involved in the campaign to get Connecticut to join the National Popular Vote um, Compact, um, which we did following the 2016 election. Um, just to be clear, we, we're not one of the first states to join. We were the first state to join after the 2016 election. Um, and there had been kind of a lull for a couple of years in terms of states joining the compact. Um, but what, um, what we found um, in that um, effort was, uh, if you get enough citizens um, interested in something and speaking out and contacting their legislators, you can make things happen. Um, and so that is essentially the model that we have used for this ranked choice vote, voting campaign. Um, we have quite a large engaged supporter base. And so when we ask them to contact legislators, they do so. Um, and they do so um, not by just like signing petitions, but they actually take the time to sort of explain why ranked choice voting is important to them. Um, we have uh, strong partners both in Connecticut and beyond. League of Women Voters is definitely one of those. Uh, so our first goal um, was, and I'm gonna use the past tense, was to pass a bill to set up a task force to study ranked choice voting, um, to study kind of all the things And I noticed somebody had a question about um, how long will such a process take and how much does it cost? These are all good questions. Um, and ones that, you know, will take a little effort to sort of get to, to all the details and answer, you know, how does the process change and the process of tallying votes and determining who the winner will change. Um, our voting equipment would need to change, although it needs to change anyway, because it really is legacy equipment. Um, but there's a whole lot of considerations that need to be explored. And we felt a good way to do this was to have a task force established that would be chaired by the Secretary of the State. Um, it would have 
um, local election officials. So the, the task force that we envisioned would have a couple of registrars represented and the town clerk and election law specialists, things like that. Um, but we also thought in addition to there being questions that needed to be answered, this was a way of starting to evangelize ranked choice voting within the legislature without sort of coming to them and saying, hey guys, let's, uh, let's implement ranked choice voting. So that, that's, that's a tall ask. Um, and we think it does require studying in terms of what needs to be done and how it would work, things like that. Um, and it's given us time to capitalize on this growing national momentum. When we started, um, Maine had just um, implemented ranked choice voting at the federal level. Um, and since then, quite other, other states have joined in, mo again, mostly at the municipal level. Um, now, we didn't think that um, asking the legislature to set up a task force to authorize a task force was really asking for much. Um, and indeed, in 2019, um, the bill was voted out of the Government Administration Elections Committee. It passed the House by a comfortable margin. Um, it did not get called in the Senate. Um, mainly not so much because we didn't think or, or people didn't think it would pass, but we didn't really have a Senate champion and we were kind of jammed up, jammed up against the end of the, the session. So we came back in 2020, the bill was raised again. There was a public hearing, about 80 people testified, 70 of the 80 or so testified in favor of ranked choice voting. And literally the week after the legislature shut down as a result of the pandemic. So that ended our effort in 2020. Um, then. We came back in 2021, um, 10 legislators introduced the bill, which is actually quite a few. Usually a bill is introduced by one or two kind of co-introducers. Um, another 28 um, legislators co-sponsored the bill. But we recognized that last year, uh, it was a very crowded agenda. And um, so you know, we, we continued advocating for it, but we weren't surprised when the bill wasn't raised. Um, but we really did want to see that happen this year. Um, we're only asking the legislature to form a task force. There's no fiscal impact. We have demonstrated um, year in and year out since we started in 2019 that there is strong grassroots support. Um, this study bill has been endorsed by, this, by Denise Merrill, the current secretary of the state, by the League of Women Voters of Connecticut, Common Cause in Connecticut, um, and a whole lot of other sort of grassroots organizations. Um, but what happened this year? Well, we did push very hard to get this bill raised. Um, we communicated to the GAE co-chairs um, several times, and I mean hundreds of people, uh, but they did not raise a study bill, or a ranked choice voting study bill. Instead, they raised um, an act establishing a task force to study implementation of voting reforms. And we kind of thought, well, maybe that's the study bill. Unfortunately, the the GAE committee has not wanted to talk to the advocates um, for this bill, which um, is a little disappointing, um, but we kind of moved forward assuming that, yes, this is gonna be the bill or this, this, this gives us an opportunity to testify in support of ranked choice voting as one of the voting reforms they should study. Um, but at the last minute that bill got repurposed into a different bill um, and that bill was, uh, was voted out of committee, I believe. Um, and the deadline has since passed. So the bill is dead this year, it's not happening. So right now we're kind of reassessing how we wanna go forward. Um, we like the idea of going through the legislature because as we said, we just kind of wanted to start educating legislators on the benefits of ranked choice voting and starting to get some kind of buy-in and interest, which, which we had in 2019. Um, but clearly there's um, really no interest um, in GAE for this voting reform, which is a little hard to explain. Um, and I'm glad to talk about that later. Um, but probably our going forward plan is just to focus on the secretary of the state um, and at least one of the candidates running, running for secretary of the state um, has um, committed to creating a task force if he is elected. Um, so, um, you know, we encourage you to, um, to, to get involved, um, whatever form our campaign continues. One of the things is really just helping to spread the word. And so um, if you know other people who might be interested, if you would like to host an information session of this sort um, with an organization that you belong to, um, or if you just want to get a group of friends together, we're happy to do that. Um, we will also um, be happy to sort of 
join someone else's meeting. So if you have a monthly meeting, you know, we'll come and we can do a much more abbreviated presentation in, in 20 minutes or so. Um, and I'm going to drop in um, our um, email um, subscribe link and we definitely um, encourage you to subscribe to our emails. We don't send out all that many and that's kind of the main way we keep people um, um, advised. I'm sorry if you feel like I ran a little over, so let's um, go right to questions and, and get through as many as we can. And I'm certainly available to stay um, past past four o'clock if people still have questions and would like to continue the discussion. Um, thank you so much again to the Litchfield Historical Society and the League of Women Voters of Litchfield for this opportunity. Okay, ready for questions? I am ready. Okay, uh, one of them is, um, what, this sounds so wonderful. What special interests are holding it back? Why is there any particular party or any particular groups that say no? Um, I don't think anybody's really holding it back in, in the sense that there's not an organized opposition. Um, it is the case that in Connecticut, um, which is unfortunately true of some of the other kind of voting reforms we've seen, there is a partisan divide. Um, so in 2019, which is only the only time that we've had people vote, legislators vote for the bill, um, it was a, a partisan vote, I mean, a party line vote. Um, but in other states, um, Republicans do support ranked choice voting. And, and here's an interesting example. In Virginia, they're, um, after their gubernatorial election, um, where Glenn Youngkin was the, the Republican nominee, the um, Republicans used ranked choice voting in their primary. Um, and there were a number of opinion pieces written after Youngkin got elected saying that there's certainly reason to believe that he, um, he ended up as the nominee, perhaps um, instead of somebody else who might have been more, uh, you know, less moderate um, if Republicans had used just plurality voting in, in their primary. Um, so there are, and we, we had that quote from Senator McCain, he was a big supporter. So um, outside of Connecticut, um, ranked choice voting is, has bipartisan support. Mm -hmm. Another question was, um... Will it take any longer to produce results or is this computerized so that, uh, particularly I've, I've read stories about New York City's primary thing being sort of messed up by its own right. advocate. So um, very good question. Um, it's certainly possible that in elections, if they have to go to multiple rounds, might take a bit longer to get the results than what we're used to. I do feel that um, the 2020 presidential election and with um, the rise in mail-in voting, ma mail-in ballots that's happening around the country and hopefully is going to happen in Connecticut um, in the not too distant future, people are getting a little bit more used to the idea that they might have to pa wait past election night to get the results. That said, in most ranked choice voting elections, first of all, remember, it only makes a difference if there's more than two candidates running. And even in those races, it's not unusual that somebody wins a majority of first round votes. So it's only if nobody wins a majority of first round votes that they then have to kind of do this iterative process. So I think it's, it's fair to say that, yes, sometimes it would take a bit longer, um, but not always. Um, with respect to New York City, the interesting to, thing to note is the problem there had nothing to do with ranked choice voting. It had to do with the incompetence of the election board. And when they produced the preliminary results, they had like, I don't know, I forget how many, a whole bunch of test ballots were still counted in the results. Um, and so that wasn't a problem with ranked choice voting. And the interesting thing to note, and this wouldn't apply to Connecticut because we don't have runoff elections, but some states um, have runoff elections when nobody gets a majority. And so one of those places is actually, it's not a state, but um, New York City, and in their primary, if nobody gets 40% of the vote, it goes to a runoff. And in the case of the New York City mayoral primary, nobody got 40% um, on the first round. And therefore, had they not used ranked choice voting, it would have gone to a runoff. And runoffs usually take, you know, three, four weeks to run. And so, and not to mention cost billions of dollars and have much lower voter participation in the subsequent runoff election. So um, one can easily, I think, make a valid argument that 
New York City got their results faster because of ranked choice voting, not slower. Mm -hmm. uh, does this system eliminate primaries or can it? Um, well, it wouldn't eliminate them. I think the, the I mean, I guess it, it wouldn't eliminate them. What, um, what could happen is what's happening in Maine where you have open primaries. Um, and it does kind of work nicely in conjunction with open primaries. And I think, you know, there's probably a growing consensus maybe that primaries are part of what is producing sort of um, the, the extreme partisanship in our elections because primaries obviously are among the parties um, and usually the parties most kind of faithful, the base voters. And so they end up um, nominating potentially more extreme candidates than um, are palatable to the overall electorate. So the combination of open primaries and a general election with ranked choice voting as Alaska did is sort of a, a, a nice combination, but you can still have regular primaries um, with ranked choice voting. And ranked choice voting, for example, you could we could implement it just in primaries and still have general election with um, with plurality voting. So it, it is it sort of does lend itself to mix and match. I think ideally we'd like to see it used everywhere, but um, you can make arguments for you know maybe testing it out somewhere first, piloting it somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, basic thing about cost: uh, who's going to pay for this, the towns or the state? Well, that would really be up to the legislature, um, and I think. It's certainly to the extent that we change our election processes because we think it's good for democracy. I think the state should be willing to pay for the costs of that. Um, and but again, part of the part of the reason for the task force is to figure out, you know, what are the costs. Um, I think, you know, from from what I've seen, the costs of once it's running in terms of, you know, the tabulating of results um, is probably not much more expensive than occurs today. I mean, it is, it's computerized. So it's not, it's not gonna create a whole lot of like manual processes that, um, you know, registrars or town clerks are gonna have to go through. Um, there will be an implementation cost and certainly an education cost, um, but there was, there was an education cost when we expanded um, no excuse absentee voting during the 2020 elections and, you know, that, that's, if, if it's going to benefit democracy, that seems to be an investment that's worthwhile. But we need to know what it is. Clearly, it's not prohibitive because other states are doing this. Um, and as we mentioned, the House just passed um, a bill, which, you know, it's not going to get, not going to get through the Senate, but they did allocate $40 million because they want to see an investment, you know, uh, uh, jurisdictions investing in ranked choice voting. Uh, will this allow, uh non-members of political parties to get onto the ballot easier or? Um, it sh I don't think it would change it one way or the other um, because you know the, the, the requirements to get on the ballot are what, whatever the requirements are. I think it produces more incentive for candidates to get onto the ballot um, and for you know, the, the reasons that I had talked about before where there's certainly a lot of kind of self-censoring in a sense of candidates who say, well, I, I don't wanna run because I don't wanna be a spoiler. Um, so I think it will encourage more people to run. But do you think it will increase uh, participation? Um, in the jurisdictions where it's being used, there have been a number of studies. And again, these are at the municipal level in, in a variety of states they have almost uniformly seen higher participation rates. And it's because people feel like they, that their voices are counting more. Um, and, you know, particularly let's say you really love the third party candidate, you know, that candidate has no chance of winning. And you might say, I don't want to vote. Um, but now, <laughs> now you, you will have your voice heard. And the other interesting thing is, um, you know, it's not, it's certainly, is not going to change our two party system overnight. I mean, you know, we still have two very dominant parties, but as you start to get third party candidates running, one, it can influence the tenor of the overall campaign. Um, and it can start showing that a candidate, let's say a third party candidate, um, let in, let's use, you know, Oz Griebel as an example. He got, you know, whatever, some very small percentage of the vote. That's not necessarily the actual. Um, percentage of the pot of the electorate that supported him is the the percentage who decided that they wanted to vote for him 
And so as people start running, you might see, hey, you know, this person with this platform, you know, like think of Ross Perot, who got 20 million votes, like that was a significant number. And he did have an impact on that race in terms of the, 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 the platform he had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the questions I can find right now. We're hey. getting close to the, the witching hour. Great, <laughs> perfect timing. Um, no, really right on the, right on the nose. But again, I want to thank everybody um, for your time and attention and interest. And um, let me pop in my, um, I'll just pop in our, our general. Uh, if you have any questions, um, voterchoicect.org, um, you know, feel free to get in touch with us and we'd be happy to you know, follow up or if you're interested in getting involved or whatever. Um, but thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it.